Okay, so hello and welcome everybody to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh, I'm the community builder at uh, Be Waste Wise. And this is our second webinar this month. And we would like to thank you all for the positive response that we received on our previous webinar, which focused on uh, LATAM region. Uh, we are here again with another waste dialogue and this time focusing on circular economy mapping. Uh, those of you who are joining here for this platform for the first time, let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization to grow around the principles of dialogue and diversity uh, since 2013. It's been a decade that uh, we have been bridging the waste solutions uh, expertise gap uh, worldwide. And today we have uh, more than 12 moderators who are coming from uh, different parts of the society and world together. Uh, they're posing questions, they're teasing out insights and guiding conversations such as these, which are relevant for those in any other online or offline platform. Uh, we have more than 300 contributors as well who are taking part in this journey. Now, if you see the value in making uh, such diverse sustainability dialogues available free of charge to anyone and everyone, then we request you all to please support us in our mission. Now, every donation helps us to create and curate and produce such waste dialogues on diverse topics every month. We encourage you all to do please check out our website and donate. We will also be sharing the link to the donation page over the chat as well. Now, moving on to the discussion today, we have Emma Burlow, who has been one such moderator, instrumental in guiding such conversations on monthly basis uh, with our audiences. Uh, Emma is one of uh, UK's leading specialists on the circular economy and sustainability in business. She has worked uh, directly with businesses on sustainability for 25 years and founded Lighthouse Sustainability in 2020 to deliver impactful advice, coaching and training. She assists boards and senior management teams to navigate the complex world of sustainability from the SDGs and B Corp through carbon and net zero to materials and circular business models. Today, Emma, Emma, along with the esteemed panel, will explore how to effectively utilize the possibilities and maximize the benefits of circular economy road mapping. And to address this uh, topic, we today have on our panel, Clemens, who's the sustainability consultant, and Dr. Halid Abu Bakr, who is a circular economy adoption and implementation strategist. Before we proceed uh, further, uh, we would request you all to please use the Q&A function for your questions to the panel. And we encourage you to please post as many queries as possible to the panel and make this discussion even more effective and uh, you know, productive for our audiences. Um, also, we would like to let you know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded uh, on our YouTube channel and our website after two weeks in time. Uh, we request you all to please use the chat function for sharing your uh, information if you have some reports, some studies, some comments for the panel. And uh, if you want to connect over LinkedIn to make you know, for networking, you can definitely use a chat function. So back to the waste dialogue and over to you, Emma. Thank you so much. What a fantastic introduction. Um, and it is great to be here and it is brilliant to see so many new faces as well in, in the audience. So thank you for joining us all the way from Maine, uh, from Brisbane, from Boston, from Nigeria and Tanzania, I think I saw, and sunny Swansea in Wales. Uh, and Wales being one of the circular economy capitals of the world. And maybe we'll hear a bit more about that uh, today. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce my panel, and I'm not going to waste a lot of time doing any preamble, but really the, um, the point of this uh, webinar today is to dive into this topic of CE mapping, which I'll be honest, to me, I work, I'm a practitioner in the field, can seem um, a little bit academic, so I want to bring it into the real world as much as I can, but talking about the global trends, because I know it's moving on quite quickly, what the value of mapping really is, what the future is going to look like um, and how best we can sort of maximize the outcomes. So really getting that knowledge and deep information that that is, is pulled together by fantastic people all around the world and making it happen. So that's what I'm all about. But over to my panel, 
Um, Clements, can I start with you? Can, can you give us a quick introduction to, to what you do? And in your own words, what's your interpretation of um, CE mapping or road mapping, as we call it? Absolutely. Thank you both for the introduction. So my name is Clemence. As you may hear, I'm French. I, uh, however, live in the UK. I'm based in London. I'm a circular economy and sustainability cons consultant. So I moved just off jobs um, in the, I think it's been like three months. So it's very, very recent. Um, I focus a lot on consumer goods industry. And I think we'll dive more into this subject mm. later on today. Um, in my own world, so my role today is also to give you like more concrete examples of what is seen mapping for businesses and how it can be like um, early hands on and what is the implementation of C mapping. Um, so yeah, my my understanding and my interpretation of C mapping is truly like how can a business do something out of a policy, for instance. Um, you have an objective. What do you need to do in order to achieve? Um, this objective, what resources do you have, what leverage you have, and like what um, is the path that you need to take in order to achieve this objective. So very happy to be here today. Brilliant. Thanks, Clement. So we will dive into those opp uh, opportunities and examples as soon as we can. Uh, Halid, your perspective, and I know you are really immersed in this world and you've got lots to share with us. So uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Emma, and thank you for the kind um, introduction. Yeah, so my name is Halid. Um, I'm an academic, um, currently working with the University of Exeter CE Hub, which is essentially one of the uh, most prominent centres, actually globally, uh, sort of uh, the the that puts together, ac ac you know, um, uh, academia practice and policy, uh, essentially to advance um, secular economy. Um, and my work uh, is essentially to uh, standardize the approach of developing um, circular economy roadmaps. So I look at global uh, efforts. I look at what uh, different countries, different regions um, of the world, different sectors mm. are doing some of the best practices, um, you know, for benchmarking. Um, and I developed frameworks that would uh, sort of um, uh, assist organizations uh, and practitioners to adopt their own sort of uh, specific roadmap, uh, different sort of mm -hmm. governance level. Um, so yeah, so I, I work on, I've developed several, uh, several frameworks, um, and I've also developed sort of different data-driven tools that uh, allows policymakers and practitioners to essentially delve into the world of secular economy road mapping and see what the what the world is doing um, in, in that space. Um, and so how long have you been working in this area, Halid? And, and would you say it's moved on a lot in the, in recent years? It has. Things are moving very, very rapidly. Um, so when I started, so of course, I've been working in secular economy for over for five to six years now um, in sort of uh, in an academic capacity. But my current work on road mapping um, is actually quite recent. So I, so I started looking mm -hmm. into global adoption and, and implementation strategies um, for the past sort of two years. And I've looked at roadmaps, some of the early adopters or early developers of roadmaps to date, mm -hmm. uh, countries, cities, sectors that have actually sort of, you know, that are some of the early uh, um, uh, adopters of these sort of these these strategies. And things have moved on. So some of the the, the priorities some of the even the authors of these roadmaps are uh, are changing. It's, it's becoming more and more sophisticated, it's moving away from the uh, you know so the 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 waste sort of, you know waste uh, oriented type of strategy to sort of um, you know uh, encompassing other facets of secular economy mm -hmm. as we know it today. So becoming more and more sophisticated and more sort of a lot richer in uh, in touching on all of the different value chains or different principles that are applicable to different value chains um, yeah yeah so so road mapping is i'd like to know a bit to... more about that because Absolutely. i'd like to know how you know the early sort of style of road mapping and what we're seeing now and of, and also we must be thinking at some point about carbon overlapping with the resources you know the sort of carbon roadmaps and i know that's not what we're going to talk about today but i am kind of interested to see whether two worlds have collided or are colliding 
Um, I don't know if you've got a view on that, uh, Halid or, or Clements. Are we starting to see quite a shift? You mentioned they're away from waste to resources, but yeah, without going too much on a carbon tangent, are we seeing a, a kind of merging of those two worlds yet? Absolutely. I, if I yeah, mm -hmm. there are there are so I mean, like I said before, roadmaps were would sort of only had this sort of national character. So we've got nations coming together. For example, China was the first one of the early. Adopts, um, uh, developers of cyclical roadmaps in the sort of uh, 20, around 2013. But then this is now becoming more and more granular. So I actually, I'll, I'll share a link to one of, one of, the, one of the, uh, the publications, one of my publications, which essentially defined a typology of roadmaps. So in, in, the, in the real realms of cyclical economy, so we've got the, the national roadmaps and then we go right down to very, very granular types of roadmaps. Uh, under which a carbon, you know, net zero specific roadmap or a roadmap uh, by a particular sector, say, for example, the chemical sector that would um, identify a particular priority within the, 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 chem the chemical sector and develop a roadmap. Uh, and these roadmaps are referred to as sort of baseline roadmaps. So, yeah, the, the, there is, the, like I said, uh, the, these are becoming more and more sophisticated. And um, you know, and, and and quite diverse. And then the trajectory is actually showing that there's more appetite for global collaboration in the development roadmaps. Yes. All the, all the different sectors coming together to to develop sort of like a a kind of like one sort of broad roadmap that touches into all of these different yeah. priorities. Yeah, that's the real opportunity, isn't it? And I'm just going to jump to a couple of questions while you're on that. Um, Halid, uh, from the audience, from uh, Manta and Nicole, similar questions. Is circular road mapping different from stakeholder mapping while developing your circular solution? And similarly, you know, is it for the purpose of metrics or is it for the purpose of stakeholders? Wh which one is it? Is that for me or for Clemens? Uh, well, Halid first, and then I'll come to you, Clemens. Okay. Yeah. So this is a really good question. So road mapping doesn't have any sort of kind of scientific definition. So we've, we had, so road mapping, so it's actually the concepts borrowed from technology road mapping, which is a, oh. an established sort of tool in, in business and in, in, in sort of in technology development. Mm -hmm. uh, there are academics like Robert Fall, who are the, some of the pioneers, some, some of the champions of this particular uh, uh, tooling. Uh, Motorola, for example, was one of the early adopters of road mapping, I don't think in the 70s. But this is now evolving. Um, and so the definition of secular economy roadmap, you wouldn't find any sort of single definition. So that's, that's what I've been doing over this time to try and give it an identity. Okay, so stakeholder stakeholder mapping is an element of secular economy road mapping. So it's a really multifaceted sort of uh, process that draws on these these different disciplines, of course, definitely emphatically including um, um, stakeholder road mapping, I'm sorry, stakeholder mapping. Okay, so the two, yeah. And Clements, in your experience, um, what have you worked more with? The sort of metrics and impact side or the stakeholder mapping side? And I kind of, you know, do you, do you see this world changing quite a lot at the moment? It's hard to say because I think they are communicating a lot, like the two mappings are very interdependent. I would say that I'm more into the metrics and like implementation of the mapping for like businesses. But of course, um, when it comes to an industry, you also rely a lot on other industries and other like trade, trade unions and other stakeholders. So I think we have the one global strategy and then we all have our own roadmaps that is adapted to our own like issue in our mm -hmm. own like resources. And when it comes to one specific industry, we also have like divergence as well. Like some businesses are very um, big and have a lot of resources or it, they have more risks because they are bigger um, and other, other companies have less resources. They have like less inputs from like the policymakers. Um, mm. They have um, less, um, resources in terms of money as well so i think it's all together so i'm not sure we could answer these questions mm. um very clearly sounds like there's quite a variety of things going on at different levels um and i think we've answered my next question is which was you know our circular roadmap just for policymakers 
clearly not. They're for different sectors. They may be um, even for individual businesses. Um, but I wanted to just, um, move, we're going to move on to a poll, but before we get to that, at a national level, and Halid, maybe you've got a, a, a better lens of this at the moment, are circular economy roadmaps generally similar or are they very varied? If you were to look at one for Australia, would it be completely different to one for Scotland? What, what's your view? So there are good and bad and ugly roadmaps. Um, so there are, there are, in my work, I've looked at over 700 different types of roadmaps. So they are not always defined. Did you hear 700. that, everyone? 700, 700 different yeah. types. 700 roadmaps, yeah. So I split wow. them into two. So one, one half actually informed the development of the dashboard, which at some point I would share the link to. It's mm. actually on the CEHUB website, which features all the different strategies um, developed globally and uh, sort of different regions and different cities. Um, yeah, so, but then these roadmaps are complete, they, they, they are all different and not all right. of them actually identify as roadmaps. Um, oh. Some of them, yeah, so they don't always come and say we're roadmaps. So what, I, we're what, I, roadmap, what yeah. I've done, absolutely, what I've done is look into all of these things and find the common denominator. So mm -hmm. all of these different strategy documents, uh, some are called action plans, for example, the European Union roadmap is actually called an action plan, but it's not act an action plan as we know it, because it does uh -huh. have all of the facets. It does have stakeholder engagement, you know, the sort of collaboration ecosystem. It does have priorities. It does have metrics. It does have KPIs. So all of these different facets come together to define what I would call a roadmap. Um, but yeah, so, so there, there might be some uh, some wolves in sheep's clothing out there. Some roadmaps there are, there are, yeah. roadmaps. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. Well, I've, I've learned something new already. Um, so I'm going to go to a poll. A okay? sure, is that all right for our first audience poll? And actually, it's going to it leads on very much from what you were just introducing there, Halid. Um, what should a CE roadmap include, even if it's not called a CE roadmap? Uh, so this might help us <laughs> spot roadmaps out there um that we didn't currently know about um because i certainly wouldn't have been looking for a ce roadmap that wasn't called a ce roadmap so you so that's a really really good point so um should they include priorities should it be more of a visioning document should they be action based should they include kpis so that's key performance indicators so metrics that you can measure against apologies for the um um Apologies for the acronym. Or should it include all of the above? And Nicole is right, only one answer allowed. So if you want more than one, you'll have to go for all of the above, I guess. So should it be priorities, vision, actions, or pop in the chat what you think, what you would have answered if you had more than one, more than one choice. Okay, so 58% of people have participated. Let's get up to 65. Here we go. So it's not a trick question. Majority of people saying all of the above. No one um, hedging their bets on KPIs, but that may have been because they uh, wanted to pick more than one. Um, so over to the panel, uh, Clements, what should a circular roadmap include? Um, if indeed very... it's calling itself. <laughs> Thanks, Akanksha. Uh, I'm very happy to see the answers. Um, and uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think it should have priorities, vision, actions, and KPA at the same time. Um, we can also like try to organize them. We have the vision that can be the vision of business or can be the vision of an industry. And then we need to identify what is our priorities because um, we also need to find like, the Pareto, like what is our 80%, like where do we have the most leverage uh, in order to implement or 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 like road mapping to mm. achieve this vision and then comes to action and i think this is the most tricky one uh what actions do we need to um take in order to achieve this vision is it um uh, based on resources is it based on um like innovation or is it based on um different business model it's it's very mm -hmm. i think this one is, is very hard and I, when we go further into like the examples that we um have um we can talk a bit more on that because i think mm -hmm. the actions can be identified but then they need to be um 
prioritized and they need to be physical. And often mm -hmm. I think we forget that. We think that we have an action that will help us uh, for a, for this vision. Maybe I can give just a small example. Yeah, go ahead. So, mm -hmm. um, if we talk about packaging and we want to eliminate plastic, um, concretely, we have different actions. We have like to to have a packaging that can be reused or we can switch to something different than plastic. But concretely, um, what is the cost of the packaging? Um, is our, our like logistic chain adapted to those solutions? Um, mm. Is our industry well interconnected? Do we have all the stakeholders that can like make it happen because it's good mm -hmm. that you're putting on the market a reusable packaging, but then we also need to have it at scale if we want to have a good impact. And there again, I'm also reflecting on the discussion that we had on carbon. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very key here to prioritize based on feasibility for an industry, a country, but also for mm -hmm. a company. So yeah, mm -hmm. long answer. So no, it's a perfect before. answer because you're getting right to the nub of the issue. So Christina's put a question here um, about how how are roadmaps being linked to practical application and implementation? And I guess this is where I was coming from before saying, you know, I've seen roadmaps and I've worked on roadmaps, which is great, but they do feel quite isolated from the day to day activities that are happening in, you know, um, in, in city centres and trading estates all around the world you know um so i guess to, to go back to christina's question how is success measured how do you know that your roadmap is successful how do you measure that um halid have you got any views on that sure absolutely and yeah just to start off from where um clemens left i think clemens i think you're you're you're, you're spot on what everything because you mentioned all the right words in the in the process you mentioned priorities you mentioned action and there isn't a unified way of linking all of these together. And that is actually what my work is all about. That is what my, my framework is about. And in terms of sort of linking all of these things, and then how do you actually define success? So what I, what I normally say is that any good roadmap, with any good roadmap, you'd be able to define the priority. So you've got a defined priority area. I've got some examples here. For example, I did a roadmap for a help the hospitality sector here in the UK, develop a roadmap, and one of the priorities they came up with was, with, was uh, to maximize the value of food waste. So the food waste already happens. Food waste example. is inevitable. Yeah. Maximizing the value of food waste, and then we develop three actions. So you could have one priority, have multiple actions, but then each action has to have a metric. You should be able to measure every action. So I define metrics as those measurements that are linked to um, the quantifiable, they are, they are quantifiable and they're, they're, they're linked to individual actions. Say, for example, implementation of composting system, for example, is one. And the metric to that is the volume of food waste composted. Simple as that. So you have that, it's measurable. We've got like, say, for example, partnering with food donation programs and then the quantity of food that has been donated to that. Okay, and then utilizing uh, waste for energy production and an amount of energy produced from waste. So these mm -hmm. are actions, these are metrics. Okay, and then all of these things would lead to a circular economy indicator. So we could have one indicator or mm -hmm. two indicators. For example, uh, you have two indicators that are linked to the priority. So the priority, for example, here is maximizing food waste um, value. And then mm -hmm. the, the two indicators will be reduction in food waste sent to landfills. So that is an indicator or yeah. an increase in renewable energy generation. So these are two indicators and one KPI at the end. So how do you measure the success? All mm -hmm. of these come together to say, okay, so to achieve a percentage, say 40% reduction in food waste sent to landfills and a 20% increase in renewable energy by 2025, by 2030. By, so you've got a timeline. So having mm -hmm. a quantifiable sort of um, uh, uh, success measurement and a timeline. So Brilliant. this is this is this is how you you're able to link your priority 
So you draw a line from your priority to yeah. your KPI, and then there's a timeline. And I think from what I've seen over the years, I think those metrics and what you're calling indicators are becoming much more sophisticated because it did used to just be waste avoided. And I would sit there as a you know circular economy consultant going, well, how on earth am I going to measure that? You know, um, a couple of comments in the chat actually wouldn't the priority be to be reduced of food waste in the first instance? So would that also be measured? So that would be kind of waste avoided, I guess, as opposed to just the value, or is that not that wasn't the priority for that project? Absolutely, we've got we've there's, there's always a hierarchy. So food yeah. waste, food waste, of course, food waste is inevitable as we know because yeah. there is always element of food waste. But Some, then I think yeah. absolutely. But then I think before you get to that, you do everything you can to minimize food waste, which isn't which is not not necessarily this. So if that, that if that features as a priority, you would have different indicators, different. Yes, measures, that's it. Right? I see. So, yeah. so you're dealing with the waste that with the arises waste, with in the a waste circular that's way. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. but there is an overlap, isn't there? And I think that's sort of something that's difficult about circular economy is sometimes the the most obvious things to do, the reduce activities, the refuse and the reduce, are actually the hardest to measure because absolutely. we don't, you know, we don't have an output. Um, uh, Clements, any anything you wanted to come in on there in terms yeah. of? Yeah, actually, there's uh, two things I wanted to add to this, um, but it's just maybe to reflect on it. You were saying there's more and more metrics, and it's true. Mm. And right. I think it's also good to know that you're not starting from nowhere, that there's a lot of metrics that right. already exist that are... Um, developed by the governments that are developed by the eu that are developed by any other area uh because i see that there's not like there's always people that are not from the eu as well um so you also need to um be able to um reflect on on those metrics metrics and also to um they, they give you a good methodology to implement those within your, your business. So I think this is good to, to know. Mm -hmm. And also to answer, I think it was Nicole's question, I'm not sure, like for mm -hmm. the, the success um, metrics, the how can we measure success? Maybe what I can add also is like, mm -hmm. um, what can we have in order to have this roadmap of success? And I think there's here two things from my, my experience. Mm -hmm. First is to have commitment from the company. If we have commitment from any anyone within the company, either someone is doing marketing or someone is doing logistics or production, anything, um, that will help us uh, achieve our objective. And second would be, it is completely linked to the first one, to have a task force. Sustainability nice. does not, it, I, I'm, I'm very, um, um, I don't know how to say that, but I really don't like it when I see that the sustainability team only sits like on the corner of the room. Yeah. I think it really needs to be within the companies at mm -hmm. every every level. Like you can have someone that is in marketing, but also very interested in sustainability. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be something to add for what can we do in order to make this see one map uh, a success. Mm, great. And I'm going to, that's brilliant. That's led me nicely into a question from Kate here that says, um, circular economy roadmaps of you set, as you say, require action by government, industry, and, and lots of other people in society. And a few people have been asking about stakeholder mapping, which, which, you know, it seems to dovetail really nicely, but how can stakeholders agree to and be accountable for actions and KPIs if there's no budget accorded to them? So I've seen this happen before where, you know, a, a roadmap for an for an area has been has been uh, worked on, you know, diligently, and you go, "Crikey, there's so much opportunity here!" And then there's nobody really to take it forward. Um, you know, Clements, you were saying about people in business, but you know, do you have a view, Clements, on how do you actually get these stakeholders to go, "Okay, that's my metric. I'll take that away, and I will work on that." Have you got any experience with that, Clements? And then I'll come yeah. to lead. Yeah, it's it's um uh, it's quite hard indeed um to do. But if your if your company has this within your value, I think uh, that's uh, one way to leverage it. 
uh, but it's it's clearly not easy. But also, it, we are coming back to what we were saying in terms of prioritization of the actions. Mm -hmm. If you are a part of a company and you feel that your company does not have the sustainable value that you believe in, uh, maybe the first step would be to like kind of map what what could be the actions that comes back to the C mapping we we're mentioning, but also to say um, to your company, okay, um, those are the pot potential actions we could take. Um, here is the one that might have the biggest impact for us. Yes. And, um, or maybe that one is the, um, the, the one that we can do in um, like with very few resources. Or like that yeah. one is something that our competitor has already done. So I think we yeah. have something to do nice. here for our, our consumers. So it's so that's where practical. mapping actually of of actions and opportunities becomes really because I think one of the things that stops people maybe getting involved is because it is very overwhelming and can look yeah. really yeah. scary. And you think, well, there's no way I can even don't even know where to start. So that whole idea of oh, actually here's an idea that should be top of the list because it ticks so many boxes. Um, so I liked your idea. And I think you said earlier about having a sort of 80, 20, you know, finding where the, the hot spots are in itself is a gift, right? Because no one really knows where the hot spots are. Otherwise, I mean, we've mentioned food waste, but from lots of businesses I've worked with, they wouldn't know necessarily without having that access to that information where their hot spots were. Okay, so um, Hallie, just to come back to you, how do you make stakeholders accountable? Um, you know, how do we stop this just being a report that sits on a shelf? Yeah, okay, so yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. So I think one of the um, things that the framework proposes is having a really good and solid governance. Okay, so no, the, the, the governance is a, it's a, it's a core component of road mapping. So having the governance structure and then defining the responsibility. So the governance, having the really good governance, taking ownership of every right. facet of the roadmap, right? So every stakeholder would mm -hmm. have ownership. So the stakeholder, so this, the stakeholder engagement sort of process is a very comprehensive state um, sort of uh, uh, process where you identify the stakeholders, you analyze the interest of the stakeholders, um, the participation, the reporting, um, you know, the, the, everything at all to do with their involvement at every stage of the roadmap has to be mapped and linked to actions. And another mm. thing is because we talked about budget here. So budget here is sort of like most mm. roadmaps don't just delve into implementation of every action wholesale. That That would completely cripple the entire process. Mm. We have pilots, so you could pilot some of these actions and you could also have sort of like um, draw on case studies right so for many 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 roadmaps for example the french roadmap i know um, sort of looked into different value chains so those value chains that uh, are involved in the priority uh drew on on existing european um um, case studies a, a lot from, right. from from the nordic countries and some from 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 the netherlands the netherlands have got a lot of granular mm. level um case studies to draw to draw on mm. so so yeah there are ways of going around the budgetary mm -hmm. issue you have to go full scale implementing any every action but then you can start mm. with 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 pilots and then pilots mm. are exceptionally good at sort of like you know um uh, um test driving some of the some of the uh, implementation um, um strategies mm -hmm. to see okay, how 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 efficient are they and before you begin to scale them um so okay. yeah so governance stakeholder mm -hmm. and and uh and piloting or, or you know drawing and case studies fantastic and that, and that governance piece i think um is really important and just to finish just to round this off what sort of timelines should we be working on so you know with businesses it's it's difficult to get them to think three or even five years ahead. But Halid, in your work, what, what timelines are roadmaps generally written over? I would say some of them are quite lengthy um, because, it, again, it, it all depends on, on the scale of the roadmap. So national roadmaps or mm. regional roadmaps usually, so most of the national roadmaps that I've looked at actually developed around 2016, wouldn't come to maturity until around 20, so some of them around 2025. 
<laughs> and and the European, we know most European roadmaps are until 2050. So they're quite, they're, they're, they're not really you know, chunky. They're, they're, quite, yeah. they're quite realistic. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, these things are, they, they, some of them would take time. So you can't, you couldn't sit, take any roadmap today and confidently conclude that no, some of these things have actually been, been real. Some of these uh, uh, actions mm -hmm. uh, or priorities have actually attained maturity. So it, it all depends, but more granular roadmaps are more sort of a, a short lived. So granular roadmaps is easier to implement, say, for example, a, 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 a an action on a particular polymer within the plastic industry, for example, and see that sort of uh, rolled out, um, you know, because there are so, so many different industries that depend on that particular polymer. So mm. if it's so granular roadmaps usually have shorter um, maturity time compared okay. with, say, national roadmaps, because national roadmaps uh, are a kind of like, they've got so many dependencies and mm. all of these things are essentially roadmaps in their own rights. So yeah. they usually take time, time to sort of... Yeah. Sure. So, so it, it all well, that makes sense. I think you need, you know, you need all of this happening at once, don't you? It's not an either or. And Nicole is saying many of the European roadmaps with long-term scopes are more visionary than the implementation. But let's just come down to some, some examples then. So just because you've been teasing me with, you know, mentions of France and consumer goods and that sort of thing. So, um, Clements, can you you work in the consumer sector, as you've said? Can you give us some examples of mapping, um, you know, in this sector? Uh, good practice, maybe not so much the good, the bad, and the ugly, but uh, good and and things that are working well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Again, also jump back on the question, the the previous question, because mm -hmm. we had in France for the um, food industry or like all industries, there is like the AGEC law, which states that in 2040, you're not allowed to have any single use plastic anymore. So imagine your life going into a supermarket and you don't have any plastic anymore. Um, for, some, some, for some of us, it's a dream. For a, like manufacturers, it's more of a challenge. Yeah. Um, so you have this, this objective, which is like so many years from now and like people that are within the companies might probably not be don't even know about it anymore no, no. and they don't know so some of them don't know about it but like others that know about it might just be retired or might be just uh, looking for another mm -hmm. company so you also have this challenge so what we did is to help those industry narrow down this roadmap and have just like shorter objectives so what I've done, for instance, for the yogurt industry in France is to help them decide what is their, so we have the vision and what is our objective in 2025, mm -hmm. 2030 and 2040 mm -hmm. um, with the objective of not, not having any more plastic in 2040. So, for instance, in 2025, the objective would be to reduce by 20% the amount of plastic. Um, for 2030, the objective would be to reduce this amount of plastic of like 50% or even mm -hmm. more if possible. And then comes to, uh, we are coming to the solutions I was referring to earlier. So what are the solutions to address that? Mm -hmm. So reducing um, the layer of plastic um, sounds very easy, but it's not that easy because for different industries like the yogurt industry, it's extremely optimized. Like mm -hmm. you're not buying your yogurt five in a big pounds. heavy thing. No, like yeah. it's it's very optimized because everything yeah. Yeah. costs a lot of money. So trust them that they are doing already their best yeah. with this. So we need to find solutions. Like what are the innovations here on the market that can help us reduce this amount of plastic? Considering, of course, um, and also that brings me back to stakeholder engagement, mm. um, considering the current infrastructure that the yeah. company has. Because if you're talking to a manufacturer that produces yogurt and that maybe created it, it, its plants about two years ago, that's billions of euros. Mm. And you cannot tell them, oh, you need to switch to another technology. <laughs> Like be yeah. realistic. Yeah. So what we did is to identify innovations that were um, uh, set for what they had in terms of infrastructure 
and also um, based on the maturity of the solution. So in 2025, maybe the solution could be to have a thinner uh, cup of, of, of mm -hmm. yogurt that is thinner and having like maybe cardboard or maybe switching to 100% recyclable pa uh, packaging. Uh, Moving those through are, steps, yeah. Exactly, and are having the priorities. 2030, mm -hmm. and because we are also sharing this roadmap to everyone, 2030, because we maybe want to engage into having um, molded fiber cups, which is not currently on the market, but because we are communicating this ambition as an industry, maybe innovators that are Absolutely. working on the subject will reach out to us and we can start working on this together. So yeah, right. this is an example and we've worked for many, many industries. And um, the objective was to, for instance, have like 10 engagements in 2025, five additional for 2030, and then goes on for 2040. Mm. It's a long-term commitment, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, for businesses to engage over that sort of time frame. Yeah. But like also, I think what was mm. super interesting is to say within, within this roadmap, okay, we have this ambition, but concretely today, um, it's not feasible te technically, or maybe no, the, current, the current legislation does not allow us to do it. Um, so that also brings some kind of communication between businesses and policymakers, which I think is key mm, uh, for yeah. C, C roadmaps. Yeah, I think a lot of this in this space, and this is what I think confuses or, or, or maybe frustrates some people, is the, the, answers, the answers may not exist yet, right? We may not have had, as you said, um, the innovation yet, or, or more often, lots of innovation is already there, but we haven't had the, the market or the infrastructure, that you know, the landscape. But I think what you said there, Clements, was really strong in terms of you need to put that vision out there to create the environment for those things. Otherwise, you will just do the same thing and make it, you will opt, carry on optimising. But unless you put it out there, um, I think that was a really, really good takeaway. Thank you, Clement. Um, Halid, uh, good practice examples. What what, what uh, would you say out of the, I think you said you've looked at 700 roadmaps. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, how can people find sources of these, these um, this information? So do you want to tell us a little about the hub? Um, and also, you know, some some good practice examples. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, they 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 have. So, I'll share the link to the um to dashboard. So, dashboard essentially the dashboard, features sorry, different, yeah. different, different, different. Yeah, so it is actually sitting on the CE Hub website. Right. So it shows you. So it's essentially made up of several plots, several you know interactive uh, uh, plots that you'd click, you you pick up a you select a country. And then you'd select mm -hmm. a uh, a variable uh, derived from from roadmaps. For for example, the priority areas of that country, the motivations behind the development of the roadmaps, the um, uh, you know the the authoring uh, agencies, uh, for example, that develop the roadmaps, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can look at it by region. You can look at it by city. You can look at it by sector. Um, and then it just gives you that information about what the global effort essentially is. Um, in terms of the roadmaps themselves, these are all out there. So these are like, again, said only a fraction of them. So you actually, again, you would see the percentage of the proportions of documents that are actually entitled roadmaps and documents that are strategies ah, yeah. and documents that are action plans. But like I said, they're all brought together because they have that common denominator. They've defined their priorities. They've got actions. They've got implementation strategies, and they've got a right. time timeline. So that is essentially That's what a roadmap complete. is mm. is about. Exactly. Exactly. Some of the most common ones are the uh, the Finnish roadmap, which is uh, by an organization called Citra. So oh, it's yeah. one of the earlier road, European roadmaps, actually after the 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 Chinese or the Japanese roadmaps, Germany. Uh, France was one of the, the strongest roadmaps out there, uh, with lots and lots of pilots in there. The Netherlands, they've got so many nation, um, um, sort of national roadmaps and also city roadmaps. The Nordic countries, mm -hmm. for example, Sweden and, 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 and all these. Of course, the United Kingdom is also uh, not, we don't have a national circular economy roadmap yet. I think this, okay. some of them are, are, you know, but then there are so many different sectoral roadmaps 
And there are so mm. many action government uh, led actions and priority documents and sort of um, policy briefs mm. that delineate all of these different phases and steps, um, which I was able to extract all of this information from. So all of these, these, these all of this information is out there in the public domain and and can be accessed. In right. in, term, in, in terms yeah. of Example. like good yeah. example exactly. Um, yeah. So maybe I can talk about on, on in, in addition to what Clemens uh, explained, which is a really brilliant explanation. Also uh, talking about innovation, so a lot of these things are actually waiting for innovation to yeah. uh, to catch up with with the ambition of of these mm -hmm. roadmaps. But but then a lot of countries and cities, what they're doing is while they're waiting to change things at the very, very beginning or the very early stages of the value chain, they look at opportunities at different stops or different stages of the value chain. For example, plastic, where they begin to, so they would have a roadmap that only targets, say, for example, the use phase of a particular product rather than go all the way back because the product is already in circulation. So you can't, you can't wait. Okay. Uh, if you are going to start to attack the beginnings or the use technology mm -hmm. or, or innovation, to change the mm. sector, what's happening to what's already in the yeah, system? You, you've got a current problem to deal exactly. with. Exactly, yeah. there's yeah. so, so much already in the So there are. So you identify oh, a particular no. stage of the value chain, and then you do. So, for example, Philips, as we know, they've got this system called the the, the model called the pay pay, pay lux mm. model, where they are essentially using um, so they're targeting the use phase of the lighting. Um, you know, uh, a value chain essentially by offering lighting as a service rather than as a product, mm. right? So that they actually own the product, they yeah. they 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 own the product, so they have they they. But then that also helps them. It it informs the design, so they could they could you know they make yeah, these things modular, mm. and uh, because of course they own it, the quality has to be different. The model, the everything has to to inform. It drives the behavior, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. It drives the behavior. It changes the the design thinking. So actually, how did they actually uh, make the product fit that uh, that business model and work and make it profitable? Did they you know say so that so that so that that one one business model yeah. affects several stages of the value yeah. chain? Yeah, and I really like products. that. Yeah, and uh, I really um, like uh, that, and I really like the point you've made about having to focus on a certain area, um, you know, and Clements, you said that, you know, we're going to need to wait for innovation to happen. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. We can't kind of ignore the problem we've already got. So with the food waste, we can't ignore the fact that we've already got food waste and just wait until we can eradicate food waste. Yeah. You know, we have to sort of, so it's almost like staging it with this ultimate aim of eradicating food waste or eradicating single use plastic. Um, and just here for a, a question from Manta, um, have either of you got any examples of road mapping in the textile sector? That's a good question. The there are. Sorry. I, yeah. I, uh, sorry, Clement. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the, I haven't got one. I mean, currently my colleagues are actually in here in the UK, uh, University um, UCL in London are actually oh, the leading sorry. the leading institute actually within the UK developing a roadmap for the for the for the uh the textiles. There have been lots and lots of initi initiatives. I've led so many different workshops in the textile sector. And the textile sector as a priority has featured quite prominently on many national roadmaps. So whilst I can't think specifically of a a, a national roadmap mm. um um sort of you know um focusing on on textiles textiles as a priority mm. is quite prominent I, I across, yeah. across different roadmaps and there are some really really innovative especially in the netherlands the netherlands they've got this the sort of genes uh mm. kind of like um uh model uh i've got i've got colleagues who are probably more confident with that particular model um and and that has been replicated all over the world yeah. Um, and there are so many, so many textile yeah. specific initiatives embedded within national roadmaps. I was uh, wondering about some African countries, actually. Maybe that's something, uh, you know, anyone in the audience could tell us about, because obviously um, many African countries have uh, issues with imported textiles, imported textile waste. And I wondered whether that had become a priority 
uh, you know, for any of those countries. So if anyone anyone does know, um, I'm just going to I'm going to move to you, Clements. While while I'm asking Clements, Halid, would you be able to put the link to the hub um, and the um, dashboard in the chat, please? It's just someone's asked about what a CE, CE hub is. So if we put the, both the link in the chat, then then that would be great. Um, Clements, um, any you know your example, any any examples in textiles that you've come across? Yeah, I did. Um, there's a lot of companies that are already doing a lot in, in regards to finding solutions. It's not, I, I'm, I'm not aware of a specific roadmaps, but if you go to um, either the Gatlin or Patagonia website, you'll see a lot, a lot of initiatives they are doing in regards to resources, like water efficiency, energy efficiency, mm. um, organic materials or recycled textile and they are also helping in the development of like um recycling technologies for for textile which is um currently uh, one of the big issue um mm. and but they are also doing a lot like along the value chain um they are working with uh, uh, the washing machine industry to develop like a, a filter for microplastic because mm. microplastics because we know that uh, textile is also like one of the um, one of the cause, maybe not the main one, but I'm not sure about the data mm -hmm. here. Uh, but yeah, I think um, there's a lot of companies that are doing a lot at the moment. Um, great examples, um, but they are not like staging it as a, a roadmap, like not if, not publicly at least. Ah, I see. So this is part of the problem, isn't it? And great to hear about your tool and the dashboard, Holly, just sort of bringing these things together. There's also an organisation called the Circular Economy Club, which some people might be aware of uh, globally. Uh, where people are, you know, trying to network and engage. And and I'm I'm aware of the time, but we've we've got about five more minutes. And I just wanted to to sort of wrap up on this last question. From what's been learnt in terms of the research and, and primary experience that we've talked about today, you know, where do we go next? To, to ensure that roadmaps actually result in tangible actions. So moving from this semi state of frustration of the last 10 years of kind of, we've got some great stuff here. So maybe what would your recommendation be in terms of if you're involved in road mapping in any way from, from whatever perspective? Um, yeah, what does the future look like Clements? What, what do we go next and how do we make sure these roadmaps really, really make a difference? Um, how to choose? <laughs> Um, but I would Big go question. for it. Yeah, I would go for communication. Um, communicate with your competitors. Communicate with well, with what you can say, of course. Um, communicate with other industries because often innovation is in other industries. Um, nice. I know that for the power tool industry, there's a lot of them that are looking at the um, vehicles um, industry. Uh, so I think I think this is the key to um, leverage on stakeholders, leverage on your trade union, and um, ease the communication between um, the um, the the ones that are implementing and the policymakers. That would be my yes. final view on this. I like that, and that and that is what we're seeing in Net Zero as well. You know, we're not going to do be able to do this in a silo. We need to collaborate. I sort of go going grey listening to people saying we need to collaborate, but we actually do need to collaborate. <laughs> um, and sharing, having an openness, I think is very important because it's a it's it's very expensive to to to, to just plough your own furrow, you know. And company A is doing this, and company B is doing that. So and I love that idea um, of, of of actually looking outside of your sector. And across. Thank you, Clements. Um, Halid, what, what would be your future vision? What do you think we need to do to get these roadmaps? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you've touched well, on that, but the, the, the sharing that you mentioned is really important. What I'll do, what I'll use is standardization. So ah, we, want, we want roadmaps to be standardized so that others can use that can benchmark off of existing roadmaps. So you sticking to ISOs, for example, the ISO 5900s, having that more sort of of that the sort of presence of some of these standards in existing roadmaps that's the first one also diversification of roadmaps so that roadmaps become more sort of uh focused 
on areas so that, say, for example, if a country is looking to develop a national roadmap, mm. it can leverage existing national roadmaps that have sort of uh, adhered to, to certain standards so that, you know, we could we could follow these these existing national roadmaps that have been tried and tested and leverage off of them. And then finally, um, to integrate technological advancements and global collaborations in the development of roadmaps, which we've, we've talked about certain uh, value chains waiting for technology and innovation to catch up with the ambition, but then having a global collaboration towards these yeah. things, I think would accelerate and would sort of like really um, get us some of the the uh, the more powerful roadmaps um, for the future. Sounds like there's a huge amount of opportunity. I mean, obviously, both of you working in the sector, do you feel that? Do you feel like we're on the on the edge of something? Absolutely. Definitely. Great stuff. Well, thank you so much. I've just written a few words down. So uh, to take away, really, the standardising, which, uh, which sounds you know, that, that that sort of gives everybody um, almost ready made tools to work with. So do pop and see the resources at the CE Hub at the University of Exeter um, and also the dashboard. Um, I really took away from from your comments, Clements, about prioritizing, hot spotting, you know, knowing where the 80 percent is, knowing where the big gains are to be had. And I think given restricted funds and time and resource, that's an absolute winner. Um, rather than saying to companies, you need a circular economy strategy, you know, get 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 use those tools to get get to the nub of things as soon as possible. And then communicate and share was the other thing I took away, um, both on the technological side. Um, Halid, but just more generally, I think we're we're missing a trick there in terms of cross sector. Um, you know, even even within policy and business, we really need to be better at that. Nicole's just met, said product stewardship programs are inadvertently forcing collaboration across traditional collaborators, uh, competitors. Sorry. So maybe we should leave it there. It's the top of the hour. So um, collaborate rather than comp compete. I think is the, the takeaway from today. Thank you so much, Clements and Halid, for joining me. Uh, it's great to have you on the panel. I'm sure if um, you'd like to be involved in any other Be Waste Wise webinars, they'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our panel today for taking time out and sharing their knowledge and experience on such topic. Hopefully we got more clarity and knowledge on CE road mapping, what needs to happen, what best we can do to maximize the benefits and utilize its objective for future. We can see we got interesting opinions and voices from the attendees today with such enthusiastic participation. Thank you so much for the attendees uh, for taking time out and participate in this dialogue. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and on our YouTube channel. So please stay updated on our uh, future events to subscribe our uh, newsletter and our social uh, social media handle. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time out. Thank you, Emma, once again. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks so much.